Get a snack, get a drink, get a bleeding bottle of wine because you might need it because this is going to be a long one. Man alive, I'm married. Shut up, you dead fucking twat! You want me to rap anyway? It would be hard if you go on holiday. I'm not your hun. Hey, what are you asking about? Really? I'm a weapon. You are a liar. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. Oh my god. Season 10 of the popular reality TV show Love Island has just finished filming and has crowned Jess and Sammy their 10th winners of the show. If you have been following me slightly or even had a whiff of me on the social media stratosphere over the past six years, you may know that I am uh, what they call a Love Island super fan. And if you are new here or you haven't heard of me, just know that this is how I reacted to the winner of season five. <laughs> I am surprised that they do not have a restraining order put against me. After the 2000s and early 2010s, there seemed to have been a rapid decline of reality TV. X Factor viewers were dwindling, Big Brother was on the verge of cancellation. It seemed that after such a high of this genre of television that it may actually be on its way out. The rise of things like social media and YouTube meant that people were able to get that sort of relatability and being able to watch real people and not actors playing a character in a far more real time and personal way than watching them on a show edited and manipulated by producers. That was all until Love Island came along. Love Island was a modern day reality TV renaissance. It gained a cult following and fan base so rapidly and it grew to a scale that in my time I have only seen the shows Big Brother and X Factor achieve. It was such a culturally significant show time where British small talk changed the weather's pretty shit recently to oh my god have you watched Love Island this week? Contestants on the show were almost guaranteed to be propelled into fame. Contestants of the show would gain millions of followers, would land their own TV show, release charting singles, have documentaries and TV hosting gigs, gain their own fashion collaborations, beauty collaborations, even release their own brands, star in West End shows, become ambassadors for important causes across the UK, and were globally recognised by actual A-list celebrities like Stormzy, Lizzo, and Margot Robbie. Heck, someone from season four did a 61 date tour. That is more tour dates than the Beyonce Renaissance tour. The show is so popular that it has gained 26 global spin-offs and has re-sparked a whole resurgence of dating reality TV shows. However, the show, with its success, garnered a lot of controversy. In recent seasons, it's been seen that the viewership has been declining and there's been countless reports that the show is on its way out. This isn't uncommon for reality TV shows. Big Brother, Geordie Shore, X on the Beach, they all have their peak. Even with scripted TV shows, to reach season 10, 11, 12 and be hitting your peak of viewership is a rarity. However, with the resurgence of dating reality TV shows on the likes of Netflix, paired with the declining viewership, is there still space for Love Island in the current landscape? In today's video, I'm going to explore the rapid global success of the show, how quickly it grew, if the show has really lost its hype, and is there any more hope for the show itself? A quick disclaimer, everything that I'm saying today has been garnered from my information from watching the show with my very own eyes, or things which I have read from contestants online or in interviews. Everything that I'm saying in today's video is alleged. Let's get on with it. Welcome to Love Island, a tropical paradise in the heart of the South Pacific. For this video, we need to go all the way back to 2005, where ITV producers decided that they wanted to create a show which would rival Channel 4's juggernaut, Big Brother. This show would be Celebrity Love Island. The show would consist of celebrities going to an island in Fiji, and they would, as the title says, find love on an island with celebrities. It is a genius name. I don't know who came up with that. They need a Nobel Peace Prize. The twist on this show would be that viewers would have control over everything the celebrities would be doing. For the next five weeks, you're going to be Cupid. By the time we're done, you could have created the next Brad and Jen. Viewers would be able to vote Islanders into the love shack so people could get to know each other better. They'd vote Islanders on dates to couple up and they would also eventually vote these Islanders one by one off the island until there was a winner. The cash prize was £50,000, which we're 20 years on almost, and the cash prize is still the same. Jess and Sammy deserve a little more than that. The show launched uh, a lot of controversy. People were claiming that the show was boring. There was nothing to watch because it was just a bunch of z living on an island, not really doing anything. There was also a lot of claims that the word celebrity was pushing it a bit. To give you context, these people on the show, they weren't the most famous people. To put it into like modern day Love Island perspective, it's the likes of your Marcel from the Blazing Squad, Danny Dyer being Danny Dyer's daughter, Curtis Pritchard, Tommy Fury and Sophie Piper all having famous siblings, Zara Holland being the current Miss Great Britain. That was the level of celebrity that you sort of get in modern day season as a one-off cast member to like give it a little bit of tabloid press. But just imagine a full season of that genre of Island. Mute for a second season and they actually dropped the celebrity off the name so it was just Love Island because of the complaints. However, 
However, they still cast the Z-listers. It wasn't normal people still. The producers also made the decision that the Islanders had to cook and clean for themselves because a lot of viewers' complaints was that this show was just giving people a free holiday. And this proved to fix the show. There was a lot of drama in season two, so much so that I actually want to watch this season, but there is pretty much zero trace of it online. Twins and models Emma and Eve Ryan were ejected after just five days in the villa. Hollyoaks actor Lee Otway actually caused thousands of pounds of damage to the villa after completely damaging the villa's filming equipment in a rage fit after Dennis Rodman entered and flirted with his partner. And a dumped contestant came back and hid in a secret suite because one of her best friends in the villa started moving to her man and came out the suite and poured a bottle of wine over her. Where is this TV nowadays? The show was eventually cancelled after two seasons due to poor ratings. However, in January 2015, it was announced that this show would be coming back, newly titled The Resort. The original premise for the reboot of Love Island was still actually going to have the celebrity format. So the plan was that they would take a bunch of celebrities and a bunch of civilians to a resort Hence the convenient titled name The Resort. These producers, they have a mind of a mastermind. And the celebrities would have to couple up with the civilians. However, they changed the format in February 2015 when it was announced that the show would come back as Love Island and there would be no celebrities or normal people. The reboot was actually going to focus on the sort of public voting aspect. Richard Cowles, the creative director of ITV Entertainment said, Our singles will live like celebrities but have to win the hearts of the public to survive. Will they pursue true love or are they just playing a game? The new look of Love Island will decide. So in April 2015, it was confirmed that Caroline Flack would be hosting a show and that it would begin its very first season of the reboot in June 2015. The boy I would like to couple up with tonight is... Oh, you're If you have ever watched a season of Love Island, no matter if it's UK, US, Germany, New Zealand, Slovakian Love Island, almost every single version of Love Island has the same basic bones and premise. A group of single girls and a group of single guys enter the villa day one in a bids to find love. Contestants are monitored and recorded by cameras and microphones 24-7 hours of the day and they have no contact with the outside world. Unless it is in a specific challenge which we see and the information is meticulously picked out. But for example that Titanic submarine that went in the ocean Nada. New contestants, otherwise known as bombshells, would enter the villa to try and offer a temptation to these couples. Show them that life is better on the other side and create a little bit of friction in there. And these bombshells would have to come in with the premise of being able to steal a partner from the couple because to stay on the island you need to be coupled up and in a relationship. Ceremonies dubbed as recouplings would happen where contestants would sort of reshuffle their couple and get an opportunity to chop and change. And if you were left single at the end of a recoupling then you would be dumped from the island. There are also things like public votes and other twists to how islanders go but the vast majority is through dumplings. Now you may be like, why is this that interesting? This sounds like a year 11 house party and the bombshells temptations will be the girls from the other school coming to steal the boys from your school. The show thrives off like an emotional roller coaster of budding romances, breakups, unexpected twists, which captivates the viewer and it gets you locked in. If you've never watched the season of Love Island, you may not understand, but anyone in my life who has sort of been on a high horse and go, oh my god, I can't possibly watch that degrading piece of media. Watch one cast or more recoupling and you get her. The parasocial relationship that you form with these people on the show is genuinely crazy. You feel their heartbreak. You can feel the falling in love. Social media presence also has a huge part to play on the popularity of the show. And I think Love Island was the first sort of TV show to actually unintentionally capitalize off the growth of social media. A lot of TV shows and reality TV shows in particular suffered with the rise of social media. But just like how on Drag Race they say if you aren't watching Untucked, you're only getting half the story. If you went on Twitter during Love Island, you're only getting half the story. Countless moments from the seasons become viral memes. Commentary is a key part and sort of what really gets people fully engaged and immersed in the show. The show also does a very good job at sort of encapsulating what is seen as stereotypical British culture, which is a key reason why it's gained global sort of success, especially the UK version. A lot of like Americans that I've spoken to, they won't even watch the US version of the show, they'll just watch the UK version. Now that we've laid out the history and the premise of the show, let's get into what I like to call the forgotten season of Love Island. So more for you. Get out of my face, I've got nothing more to say to you. Love Island season one is a very much an anomaly. It sticks out like a sore thumb when you view the past 10 seasons side by side. And to a lot of people, including myself, season two is where most people started and season two is sort of where people view it as the first season. Whether they don't know there's a season before or they just view it as a first season because that's the first season they watched or knew about. I did go back and watch season one of Love Island because I started at season two and it's a very different experience watching a season in hindsight. So I can understand why a lot of people don't go back and watch season one and it's sort of just left in the past, especially because the format is actually pretty 
completely different. If you go back and watch it, it's almost an unrecognizable show. As I previously mentioned, the original season of the reboot still wanted to focus on that public twist. So there was live dumping shows every Thursday, very typical of Big Brother UK, which had live eviction shows every Friday night. The public had way more power in season one than we have ever had in any of the other seasons of Love Island. Only three were actually dumped, not through some sort of public voting. And the show actually launched to a live audience, which I kind of like. I think we should bring back the live launches. Also, speaking of the launch, if you go back and watch season one, there is a little Easter egg. You know the little promos that they do where it's like, meet the Islanders and it's them at their job is very badly acting. Alan Anderson from season two is actually one of the extras in season one. Fun fact for you all. Season one felt very much like there was not as much structure. There was no forced morning debriefs on the day bed. There was no set up conversations by producers. In recent seasons, you can really feel the presence of producers on the show. In the past few seasons, you will be watching the show and be like, these two have clearly been told to sit on this bin bag and have this conversation. Whereas if you go back and watch season one, it really feels like you're a fly on the wall watching a live feed of a typical girls or lads holiday. However, there was certain aspects of the season that felt so overproduced, but that is because the show was trying to find its footing and find out what it really was and I think producers were trying to throw elements of all sort of popular reality TV shows to see which ones stuck. As I said you had live show dumpings every night which was reminiscent of Big Brother. Caroline would actually live speak into the villa to the islanders very much like how Davina or Emma on Big Brother would be like housemates you are live on channel 4 please do not swear. Then you had sort of aspects of a made in Chelsea Geordie Shaw show. Callum Best who was the season 2 winner of the old Love Islander came in in season 1 and took the boys on a night out on the Magaluf Strip. Oh, oh, I'm not lit. That night out would be my genuine idea of hell. And I'm not trying to shame anyone. Felt very, why, why, Georgie Shaw. It was filmed in like very glossy, slow-mo dancing sequences in the club. This would never happen now, by the way, due to safeguarding, because you know on that night out that they went on, they brought two girls from the club back to the villa and stayed over in the villa. Moments like that where it was a live dumping, Alan Best would appear in the villa. It reminded you that, yes, this is a very much produced reality TV show. But 90% of this season, and felt like very raw. You'd have the Islanders smoking, you'd have them drinking as much as they want and quite clearly getting blackout drunk. Openly have conversations about people and if they're playing a game. Remember this was the first season since 2005 and reality TV landscape over those 10 years completely transformed. Especially with the rise of social media, these people really had no idea A, how they were coming to come across, B, what ITV2 could necessarily show. For example, season one Islander Zoe Bassia Brown entered the villa as a proud Christian woman and she was very open about that. And during the show, she had a night in the hideaway with her partner, Jordan. They ended up, I mean, we don't know for certain if it's S. EX. It very much was pointed towards that. She tried to go about it in a way where it wasn't going to be obvious what she was doing. She went into the bathroom and was like, oh my god, Jordan, there's a huge spider in here. Because she knew that there would be no camera in the hideaway bathroom. Or did she know that the episode would then end with a zoom-in shot on the bathroom and some very suggestive noises, to say the least. In her head, she explained that she thought that that wouldn't be able to be shown on TV. It was the first season, these people had no idea. The relationships, both like romantically and in a platonic way, felt very real. We got to watch Jess Hayes become the villa's villain, to winning over the audience and becoming a hero and winning the season. John and Hannah's tumultuous relationship, which ended in an engagement. There was even a contestant, Bethany Rogers, who literally came into the season because she wanted to tell Jess Hayes how she felt about her. This was the most explosive fight of the season and it felt real. This was not doing it for the TV. The red flush in their faces, you could tell that these were, girls were ready to tussle. Bethany has since come out and said that when she was waiting at the airport to board her flight to go to the show, the producers actually rang her after she checked in and called her saying, you know what you need to do. Basically implying that she needed to go in there and shit up. They then placed her in after they had fed her with alcohol so she was drunk and obviously going to be more volatile. So as you can see, producers obviously still meddled with stuff. This season did have some extremely problematic behaviour towards the woman on the show, which is is 10 season later is still an issue which we'll get onto later. Particularly the eventual winner Jess Hayes. He was constantly slut shamed from both the men and the women in the villa and sort of deemed as unwanted just because she was open and had some sort of sexual liberation which god forbid a woman in 2015 would openly say that she wants a shag. The show actually only ended with 570,000 viewers and only gained 100,000 viewers from the very first week to the final week. For a show to set up a whole villa and live eviction, fly all these people out, it's probably not the payoff that they expected. However, it was announced at the end of the season that it was renewed and applications were open. This must have seen it. They must have had that That's So Raven sidekick because season two, that is when it kicked off. On Valentine's Day 2016, that is kind of see you next Tuesday to announce Love Island's coming back on Valentine's Day. The 
producers deserve the gold star for that one. The producers, you ain't, you, you ain't that bitch or nothing, but you ain't that one little thing. Yeah, you, you're not that bitch or nothing, but yeah. you still yeah. ate that little one, yeah. that little one thing, ate that one thing. Yeah. Anyway, on Valentine's Day 2016, it was announced that Love Island would be back for a second season. Season two would be the season which really got the public tuning in and hearing about Love Island for the first time. The general public, even if they didn't start watching it, first heard about it mostly through season two. It crept into mainstream media across all different forms. It was announced prior to the season starting that the Thursday night live shows would be scrapped and not be a feature on season two. It would allow the producers to pace the season better because when they had that live dumping at Thursday, they had to make sure that the show was like in time with that Thursday night. It also allowed them to sort of pace the season better in terms of a certain group of people were getting on really well and providing great entertainment to push back dumpings or if it needed a switch up and it was getting boring to add people in or kick people out. It sort of allowed them to develop storylines better and I get it and I think it was a good decision to get rid of live shows. If there was a world where we could still get Love Island live shows, that would be so good. This season was a work of art. It needs to be hung in a museum. It is a creme de la creme of modern reality television. It had that perfect cusp of doing a full-fledged reboot season, seeing what worked, seeing what didn't work, seeing what the public liked and didn't like, and being able to tweak all those things and refine it, but also to not have so many seasons before where A, the show grew to a large scale that the people going in knew what to expect, that there wasn't like loads of seasons for people to go back and study and see this person was really popular so I'm just gonna copy them. And it cared a lot less about what the public thought because as I said, season one only finished with half a million viewers. Some highlights of the season include the first ever ejection on the reboot as contestant Malia hits Katie and within hours of entering the villa is asked to leave. Rykard was the first person to voluntarily leave the show as his partner Rachel got dumped and he wanted to leave with her. And as he was leaving, Caroline revealed that he actually had slept with Olivia Pryor. I can imagine that Ryanair flight back home to Gatwick Airport was awkward. Also had the first ex-partner entering the villa, which we've had a few times since, but Tom Powell's ex Emma Woodham entered the villa during the season. There was multiple sex scenes, which was pretty groundbreaking for reality television in Britain, but this season showed fully fledged sex scenes. It was also the first season to have a same sex couple, which was pretty revolutionary for 2016. And also there was the iconic night of Katie and Olivia in the hideaway. What the fuck you want about? These people had no idea how big the show was becoming on the outside and be going to become in the future. And they were just f***ing shit up however they please. They had no idea that the show could actually result in tangible fame. I'm sure they thought like, oh, I'm going on TV. Like, eh, eh, eh. I'm sure they thought that they might come off and get like a little like, OK magazine shoot. A two month sort of stint of PA appearances in a club to get some extra cash before they go back to their job. But I don't think they thought that they were going to become actual like celebrities in the UK. What these islanders from this season still work as full time influencers to this day. Katie McDermott from the season has just appeared on the recent season of Love Island as a comeback contestant. And Alex and Olivia have even had their own show on ITV2. So this season was really the first one to propel these people into this fame. Those previous moments that I mentioned, like the first same sex couple and Malia getting ejected. They brought a little bit of controversy and interest into the show. There was two sort of key pinpoint moments for different reasons were what really brought it into the mass public eye and got people tuned in. The first one, and maybe to a lesser extent, at the time of the season airing, this felt absolutely huge. But looking back, the other moment probably has a bit more longevity, but anyway, I digress. Contestant Marlon Anderson was coupled up with her partner Terry Walsh for pretty much the majority of her time on the show. There was a public vote, people to vote for their favourite islander, and Marlon received the fewest votes and was dumped from the island. However, Terry decided to stay on the show. Really returning to the UK, Marlon realised that Terry had forgotten about her, and they actually showed a clip at the, like, sort of reunion thing of them putting it on and showing Marlon for the first time. If that was me, you better cut those cameras or someone is about to lose their job or I. Marlon was obviously not best pleased because when she left, Terry was like, I I'm, I'm here for you. I'm just staying in the villa just for the sake of it, but like, I'm here for you. Which, where is the logic? Well, the producers knew not to miss a trick in the book and they brought Marlon back for the ultimate takedown on Terry Walsh. Mug me off completely. No, it's been the a test. The whole of f***ing England has seen it and it's right. funny how much support I've got. F***ing joke. Um, do you want to give me my sunglasses back? <laughs> Now this to you may be like, okay, like she had a go at a boy, like this isn't anything pivotal or monumental. But during the time of watching this season, I remember I shared this to my Facebook page because I needed everyone to see it. It was huge because it felt like the first 
time in Love Island where it was an event. In modern day seasons, you have things like Casa Amore coupling, a movie night. You have specific episodes which you know is always going to be drama fueled and filled and everyone's going to tune in for. Season 2 didn't have that. So to have a previous contestant come back and confront someone who is currently in the villa, a lot of people being like, wait a minute, this, this is good TV, what is it? Because it had such a reshareable aspect to it. And to my memory, it got a lot of people being like, I'm now going to start watching. The other main thing that got people tuning in and hearing about Love Island for the first time was contestant Zara Holland. Zara was the current reigning Miss Great Britain when she entered the villa. I am Miss Great Britain. And I'm the current Miss Great Britain. <laughs> Miss GB is keeping her options open. It was sort of a running joke on social media at the time that she couldn't stop saying that she was Miss GB. It was a pretty harmless joke, but it made this whole Miss GB title a thing. One night, Zara got voted by the public to go into the hideaway with new contestant Alex Bauer, which looking back is kind of weird. I don't really like how public get the choice of who goes into the hideaway. She made the choice to partake in some activities which I'm not going to say because I don't want to get demonetized. This upset the Miss Great Britain team and they actually stripped Zara from her title while she was still in the villa. Taking my title off me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wasn't best pleased Bless her. Zara has since come out and explained a lot about the show, which I'm gonna get into later in the video. But just for context, I'm not trying to trivialize this or I'm not trying to be like she was overreacting because when you hear a lot more about Zara's story, it explains a lot of the reaction. Zara eventually decided to leave the villa after receiving news that her mum was unwell. However, this made like national headlines. People were debating that it's 2016. Women should be able to be sexually liberated and choose to have sex and not deem it as an inappropriate thing for a woman who is Miss Great Britain to do. There was a debate on Loose Woman with the girl who actually took Zara's crown. 8,000 people signed a petition to reinstate her with the title. Anthea Turner even called out people to sign up to the petition. And host Caroline Flack also called out the Miss Great Britain team. She said that Zara didn't have a voice to speak and they very publicly took her title away without telling her. I want to take this moment to add that Caroline is another reason of a huge success of this season slash the show as a whole. Caroline is synonymous with the show and it helped that people knew of her before. I think she presented extra factor in a few other shows, but what really catapulted her into being like a household name was her hosting Love Island. Think of Caroline, you think of Love Island. When you think of Love Island, you think of Caroline. You could tell that Caroline were huge, genuine fans of the show. You could see Caroline's excitement when she got to go into the villa and speak to the contestants. Did you feel like you were getting represented as a viewer in there? I remember my mom was asking me about Zara Holland because she saw it on Loose Woman. The Marlin incident and the Zara incident sort of gave Love Island legs to move into other demographics who would typically sit down and put Love Island on at 9 p.m. every night. It was the first two sort of moments which were able to transcend to almost everybody in the UK and get people being like, well, well, wait a minute, what is the show? I need to tune in. However, I will say about these early seasons, if you do go back and watch them, they do sort of feel, as I said, a different show and almost a bit more dark. I mentioned in season one, there was a lot of shaming towards Tessent Jess Hayes and that sort of misogynistic attitude. They're not trying to sugarcoat it. They're not trying to disguise their misogyny and something else. They are literally just plain right being nasty. I think in recent seasons when people sort of are in a tricky situation, someone is behaving a bit mad, they are able to sort of get clarity from on-site psychologists, which I'll get onto more later. These earlier seasons, which is so easy to say with hindsight, could have been helped and benefited with be able to talk through situations that are happening in the villa. Multiple contestants of this season have come forward to say that they had no idea how big the show was going to get. Season 2 contestants have said they would have never done it if they knew how big it was going to get. They behaved completely differently. You remember all the great moments of that early Love Island because of the drinking and the smoking and the fights and it, in your head you remember it as being so entertaining but I think if you go back and look at it through a sort of 2023 lens you can tell that the way the show was produced was extremely problematic. There was lots also speaking behind people's backs which is I think one of the worst things to watch on a show like Love Island because you're watching in real time someone having no idea what all the other contestants are saying about them behind their back. So whilst people are always constantly saying we need to bring back old Love Island to get the show good again, there becomes an element where you need to like yeah it would be great if we could watch people get blackout drunk on TV because that's the most entertaining thing to watch. But what effect does that have on the person itself? And as much as producers meddle and people want to believe that the show is scripted, at the end of the day these are real people. Despite all that I've said, controversial season two is what really got the show its legs and up and running. It got the show up 900,000 viewers from the previous season reaching 1.5 million viewers and those viral moments that I talked about was really what gained the show the cult following that it has today. That aspect of being able to see a moment and it going viral and have all this discussion around it is really what Love Island roots its success in. The show was up a million viewers and the rise was only just getting started. Ten. Season three 
is the first season where Love Island understood concept and purpose and it's the show that we know now. You can watch season three and recognize it to a current season. The budget was clearly upped from the previous seasons because the camera qualities was better, the editing was better, there was a hell of a lot more slow-mo, felt a lot more glossy and like a properly produced television and less fly on the wall documentary reality TV that the previous two seasons were. The season was also the start of a lot of staples and things which Love Island now revolves itself around. This was the first season with After Sun, it was the season Season that the baby challenge became popular with viral memes of cashews and it was also the season Catherine Moore was introduced. This season was the first to acknowledge the outside world which I think as I mentioned is a key part of what Love Island roots in. Commentary from social media. You had your challenge where they would read headlines of what the press was saying. They would have challenges where they would read what tweets were saying. They had Stormzy FaceTime into the villa. It made it feel like a lot more of a big thing and also I don't know if this is a bit of a reach but it was the first season that embraced it like merchandise point. You were able to buy a Love Island water bottle and personalize it yourself. It adds to your connection to the show, the novelty of the show. I mean, it was obviously just to, like an easy money grab, but it was a thing if you had a Love Island water bottle. Obviously, in today's day and age, I'm sorry, if you're walking back with a Love Island water bottle, you need to check yourself into a cringe rehab, darling. I'm sorry. But in 2017, it was rare to get those Love Island water bottles. And you were the bee's knees if you did. Through the break of season two and season three, the word of mouth started to spread. And there weren't so much celebrities as such, but a lot of the season two finalists would get paparazzi on nights out and be doing plenty of club PA. Also, influencers have become a properly, like, fully fledged thing in society. As I mentioned, YouTubers and social media was on the rise, but it was sort of a niche aspect of the internet. I feel like in the year 2017, it was the year of like the Instagram influencers. It was the year where people could go viral for having good fashion sense or be good looking and make six figures just off of that. The reason why Love Island was able to find its feet because it gave these attractive looking people a platform to gain all these followers and they had an avenue to come off the show and carry that on, make the show remain relevant. In previous sort of reality TV shows, if you think back to Big Brother, these people were being watched by the same amount of viewers but their fame would last about six months because there was no social media. There was nothing really to keep them in the public eye. Whereas social media gave these islanders their own tools to be able to remain in the public eye and not only keep them self-relevant but the show relevant. I have aptly named this season of Love Island the Goldilocks season. Season 3 had a perfect sort of combination of that sort of raw real reality TV. They hadn't quite brought in the smoking and alcohol ban yet. You had Olivia Atwood who was a top here, Islander. I think a lot of her outbursts nowadays would probably be edited out the show. But you also had that light-hearted, family-friendly, and brand-markable stuff that Love Island has become now. Chris and Kemp's friendship is the obvious one to me. Be spoken about in daytime TV because it wasn't just sex and smoking and rock and roll. You had Chris and Kemp's friendship and you had Camilla's journey to find love. Both of these storylines are wholesome and it felt like you could maybe buy into it more in a sense that like it wasn't tacky. It wasn't just like people going on TV smoking and shagging and swearing. Especially Camilla's sort of journey and storyline was really interesting to watch as a reflection of society as a whole. And there was, of course, a conundrum of viral moments from this season which helped the show get and gain new viewers. The phrase, my type on paper, was originated this season from contestant Olivia Atwood, which is still used to this day now. Marcel went viral for quoting, I used to be in the Blazing Squad. It was the first season which saw Islanders return to the villa after being dumb. And you had Georgia Harrison stealing chem, which resulted in a viral meme from Amber Davis. It had huge moments which sparked a lot of conversation and interaction really online. And these viral moments reflected in the rating. Series 3 viewers average rose to 2.5 million. Launch episode opened to just under 2 million viewers. And the final was received by over 3 million viewers. Without knowing what was to come, a crazy figure for a channel like ITV2 at the time. And this success of the show reflected in these islanders becoming actual celebrities. As I mentioned, like previous islanders would get papped on a night out and do a teeth whitening brand deal. But this cohort of islanders were getting a real deals and opportunities that would only be reserved to actual celebrities like singers and actors. Kem and Chris, Liv and Chris and Amber Davies all received their own spin-off shows. Kem and Chris also released a top 15 rap single. They were contestants receiving their own spin-off shows. They were also being featured on shows as celebrity. Kem set any place third on Dancing on Ice. Johnny Mitchell and Gabby Allen both took place in Celebrity Big Brother. Mike Thalassitis and Olivia Atwood joined on Celebs Go Dating. This was the first time that these Islanders were being included in 
giving the status of being a celebrity. Which was a big deal because it really solidified Love Island as a genuine reality TV show and not something that was cheap and tacky but things which actually gave people tangible success. Amber Davies and Olivia Atwood both saw fast fashion clothing collaborations. Amber Davies from the season went on to star in multiple West End shows and Chris and Ken were receiving extremely high paid media work. And this was obviously more of an incentive for people to apply for future seasons. If you want to be famous or if you want to be a singer or if you want to be an actor or even just an influencer, it was a viable route as a shortcut to be able to get to that. That reflected in the amount of people that applied for season four. Because more people applied for season four of Love Island than applied to Oxbridge. I don't even think that's that big of a deal. I remember at the time everybody was like, we're just failing as a society. How are we doing this? I'm not smart enough for Oxbridge. So of course I'm gonna go for Love Island. I'm probably gonna make the same amount of money on Love Island as doctors from Oxbridge. All of those things helped this season become the season which cemented it into British culture. The show became so big that it was creeping through into all aspects of British media. And it resulted in a lot of people forming a moral hierarchy over the fact that they didn't watch Love Island. People were becoming celebrities who were written about in the press every day, going on to different TV shows, being played on the radio. You couldn't escape these people. So eventually at some point you just sort of give in and go, for God's sake, they're everywhere. I might as well just watch the season so I a bit of context on who these people are. And the Love Island hat was real people. It carried through into season four, where the opening episode received the highest rating on a digital TV program since the 2012 Summer Olympic Games. If you know how big the Summer Olympic Games was, I had Union Jack everywhere on me in the 2012 Olympic Games. I would not do that now, however. I do not support this country. But back in 2012, the Olympic Games was a big deal. So to be the most watched show since then, Olympics, Love Island, you gotta question which one's more popular, no joking. Also the most watched program ever on ITV2. The series felt like you really, really had to watch it. All the conversations surrounded it. There was debates on morning TV about whether Love Island was appropriate. One of the most famous UK soap stars being Danny Dyer, his daughter, also aptly named Danny Dyer, appeared on the show. You know, you're reaching soap audiences, morning TV audiences, daytime TV audiences. These aren't the stereotypical people who usually watch Love Island. They now know, even if they're not watching it, what Love Island is. And as I've done with all the previous seasons, there was the viral moment. The most famous being Hayley Hughes not knowing what Brexit is. Part of Europe, yeah, yeah, which would yeah, mean yeah, like definitely. welfare, like things we trade with, would be cut down. So does that mean we won't have any trees? No. Cheese? Uh, trees? At the time, I thought this was the funniest thing ever, and now I'm looking back and I'm like, is this how other countries see us? Is it really? Because I understand why you hate British people now, I really do. Hayley Hughes also spurred the viral, I'm not your hun hun. Megan Barton Hansen's love triangle became a source of controversy, as well as Adam Collard and his despicable waves in that villa. This also sparked Rosie Williams to have a photo shoot to get him back, which many people found hilarious. What? How can we forget Georgia Steele's catchphrase loyal? But in my opinion, this season sort of worked as season to properly cement it. Stuck to what they knew and what worked last season. And again, it worked for them again. The, there wasn't enough seasons at this point for viewers to be getting bored of this formula. If new viewers were being brought in from all this extra press coverage and the success of the previous season, they knew that it was a formula that the viewers enjoyed so they didn't have to risk anything. This season, of course, did garner up some controversial moments which were in the news. From things as like heart as is Hayley Hughes meeting with Nigel for after she thought Brexit meant that we wouldn't have trees and holiday. 2,646 Ofcom complaints about Danny Dyer's emotional abuse from the show. The girls received a postcard from what the boys were up to in Casa Amor and the producers meddled with it and gave a picture of Jack kissing a girl and Danny was distraught by this. And there was also complaints to Ofcom against Adam Collard's behavior towards women. So much so that Women's Aid actually came forward and put out a statement. This series really felt like Twitter were going at it. And at a time when Love Island was growing, that obviously was really beneficial for the show. Went onto your explore page on Twitter, and all of a sudden, Hayley Hughes is trending, and you're like, who is this woman? And you find out that it's a girl from Love Island. But unlike other reality TV shows, Love Island goes out almost live. I mean, there's a couple of day delays. In the villa, you don't know what public's reaction is of you. A lot of other reality TV shows, particularly in the UK, are pre-recorded like months before, which allows contestants to sort of go home, process and accept what happened and what is about to go out onto TV, and also have access to social media to be able to get their side of the story across and explain themselves if 
people are not impressed with them. Contestants of Love Island have no idea about how their public reaction is going down. So as much as that Twitter had a hand in how popular the show became, it meant that when these islanders came off the show, there was a barrage of tweets, public reactions, and things people had to say about them came all out at once. The season four saw more success than the season three contestants. Instagram followers were at an all time high. Previous seasons, such as season three, you sort of had to be in from the start to the final so people could get a full journey of you, want to buy into your sort of post Love Island career, be able to gain followers. Season four, you could be in a short of a week and come out to a million followers. Because it was the season with the most sort of new people joining in and finding out about it, it meant that you didn't have a whole backlog of previous islanders that you already followed. So all these people seemed new and exciting and you wanted to follow them all. The first dumped islander, Kendall Knight, rose to 900,000 followers after only being in the villa for the first six days. Thanks to the successful guest appearances on TV shows and brand deals that the season three islanders partook in, proved to media outlets and corporations that these islanders, they were lucrative and they were a really easy way for the brand or the show to make money and gain attention. Also, thanks to the constant attention that the season three contestants received post-show, it made the viewer readily available to already buy into the post Love Island experience. It wasn't like, oh my god, wait, this person's on a reality TV show. This person has their own show. What the hell? You were expecting that to come in, so you were already buying into like what they were gonna do next before they had even left the villa. Resulting in contestants like Samira Maie, Hayley Hughes, E.L. Booker, Ellie Brown, and Zara McDermott reaching up to a million followers. They've all appeared on multiple reality TV shows despite not playing a part in any major storyline of the season, and most of them didn't even make it past the halfway point. It wasn't just one or two contestants. It wasn't just like your Kem and Chris got a show, and then the rest were forgotten about. It was about 20 people out of a cohort of 35 who were pretty much unescapable for the full calendar year until the next Love Island came around. It became impossible for people to pretend that they didn't know what Love Island was or what was going on because it was in every form of UK media. I was coming back here to tell you that I love you. Season 5 is the most popular and often regarded as the best season of the show. If you have ever watched a season of Love Island, the chances are that it is probably this one. While the season did have its controversial and its funny moments, I think a real key aspect as to why people really like this season is a lot of the drama or the dynamic or the sort of just general storylines in the villa mainly revolved around the actual relationships. You got the journey of Curtis and Amy leading towards the unlikely partnership of Maura and Curtis. You got to watch Molly Mae and Tommy Fury fall in love right from the start. You saw Amber get mistreated by Michael and you were rooting for her to try and find love in this villa. You had Anna and Jordan. You ask a girl out two days later. Two days! The previous series, series four, first to ban smoking and drinking. Series five felt like the first show which was adapting itself to be able to watch by a younger viewer, which would result in it being better commercialized, which would result in the studio making more money. Pretty much any sex scenes were cut to the point where it was like, if you saw two seconds of someone's foot going boop boop, or you saw someone going over the covers, it was oh! Where literally three seasons prior, it was a full on five minute montage that you would find on an adult website. And I think the fact that they were now focusing on storylines of relationships and sort of shying away from the drinking aspect of the show and the bitchiness of the show and the like, promiscuity of the show, it was able to pigeonhole itself into a like, a middle ground where it still could like, suggest stuff, but you wouldn't be at the point where you would worry if your like 15 year old was watching the show. There was a few controversies of the show. Contestant Sharif Lane was mysteriously removed and it later came out that he actually kicked Molly Mae in the vagine. I think this is true? It seems bizarre. <laughs> the seasons began to start feeling a bit more formulaic. It felt more like there was an agenda with the day. The Islanders would all be waking up at the same time. They would then be put into a specific morning debrief chat. In seasons earlier, they could wake up whenever they wanted. They could even have, oh my gosh, God forbid, a bath in the middle of the day if they wanted to. It felt a lot more natural. And this sort of staged thing every episode, I think also slightly adds to the fatigue of the show. Because unless there's a dumping in the evening, specific challenge during the day, the episodes can start to feel like Groundhog Day. The ratings finished at an all-time high and a high that the show has not seen since at 5.6 million people watching the show, making it the most watched show on ITV2 to date. And obviously, of course, with the most successful show, saw the most successful contestants. I mean, I don't even need to speak on Molly May's accomplishments post-show. They speak for themselves. Curtis and Tommy did receive a spin-off show, which not many people ever speak about because the boxer and the ballroom dancer. Did anyone care? Like, what? It was safe to say that the Love Island hype was full steam ahead and it looked like there was no stopping it. Congrats, hon. 
A few days prior to season five ending, it was announced that Love Island would now air two seasons a year, with one being a winter Love Island in January filmed in South Africa. Now, in premise, this should be a really good and smart idea. It's January. No one wants to go out. Everyone's broken, doesn't want to spend money. It's cold, so no one wants to leave the house. They're gonna be in every night at 9 p.m., so there needs to be something on the TV to watch. It should serve as a sense of escapism because everyone is in cold and miserable UK. But in reality, I think what the show really lacked was that aspect of relatability. Even though people are obviously more busy in the summer and are out more, there's that sense of like joy. <laughs> Say the least. The UK is bloody miserable in winter, all right? But people are happy in summer. People want to watch other people falling in love. It's a nice thing to watch because you're also happy. If I'm miserable and broke off my ass in January, I don't want to be sat in nightly watching these hot people get in a gorgeous tan and falling in love while I'm single and miserable. Like, what? there's no there's no fun in that. And I think people really underestimate the sense of relatability that Love Island heavily relies on. I do think they maybe missed a trick and it might of work that they leaned more into the whole winter aspect of it. They actually went to like a chalet. Why did I say chalet? <laughs> chalet! But if they went to like somewhere cold and they were all wrapped up and bundled in coats with hot cold coal, that could have been fun and cute to watch. Like I don't want to watch you on summer holiday. And I also think people underestimate the parasocial relationship that people form with these contestants. It's not just a 9 to 10 p.m. show that you put on and switch off. The social media, the constant interviews, Islanders coming off and doing podcasts, you get fully engrossed and wrapped up in these people that you do genuinely become emotionally connected. The people who might be saying, that is so dramatic, I do not have any emotional connection to someone on Love Island. How many times a day when Love Island is not on are you checking the Love Island hashtag? How many TikToks of Love Island are coming up at your For You page where you casually scroll? How many interviews have you watched when Love Islanders have come off the show? Speak to your friends and family in person and in group chats about it daily because these people are real people they're not a tv character where you can like sort of compartmentalize that this isn't a real person and these aren't real feelings far more harder effect on your emotion and your empathy because you are fully aware that these are real people and this isn't anything new or specific about love island it's about the whole reality tv genre in general and it's why the genre of television has become so popular you feel a sense of connection and closeness to the people on your tv screen that you will never achieve or it will be very hard to achieve through a script a television show. Big Brother back in the day had 24 hour live stream. You could literally physically watch these people for 90 days 24 hours a day. At the start of December, the initial teaser for the first ever season of Winter Love Island was dropped with host Caroline Flack. However, on the 17th of December, three weeks prior to the series starting, it was announced that Caroline Flack would be stepping down from her hosting duties due to ongoing assault allegations made against her, which she entered a non-guilty plea. For a show which didn't actually rely too much on a host, Caroline's missing presence would be very obvious and it would be a very big role to fill. I mentioned it a little bit earlier on, but Caroline really was the embodiment of the show conversations on the opening episodes, to the ad-libs that Cassa and Maury coupling, to asking the questions that we all wanted to hear on After Sun. She had been on this show since its reboot and she really felt like the backbone and the thing that was consistent every season. Rumors started spreading around about who would be taking over from this hosting duty. The favorites seemed to be Maya Jammer, Gemma Collins, and the previous season Islander Maura Higgins. However, on the 20th of December, it was announced that Laura Whitmore would be stepping in as the season six host of Love Island. Fans were not happy with this reaction. And to be honest, I never really got why people weren't happy with this. And I'm still convinced to this day that everybody hated Laura Whitmore because viewers weren't aware of who she was going into the season rather than her actually being a bad host. And that sort of first impression just stuck with their head. Because the expectations were so high about who was going to take over, there was obviously an initial disappointment when someone who most viewers hadn't heard of before was going to be taking over. Especially when Caroline was such a loved host. So as soon as she entered the show, everybody was just like, get her off, get her off. Because if you really go back and look, she wasn't that bad. I read somewhere, but I can't seem to find it online now. So this is all alleged. I, I don't actually know if this is actually factual. But I'm pretty sure I read somewhere online that Laura went was always contracted to replace if anything ever happened to the host. I feel like this is true because I feel like it's a random thing for me to make up. She hosted the initial answer to Winter Love Island, which is a show named Survival of the Fittest, which aired in 2018. So she was always in that pipeline and it does make sense, but I can't seem to find it online. So take it with a pinch of salt. Despite the controversy of Laura being the host, ITV were not backing down on the decision. It left a sour taste before the season even begun in the viewer's mouth. The season started on the 12th of January, 2020, and there was already a big difference because the Villa was obviously it was going to be different because one's filmed in Spain, one's filmed in South Africa. But this Winter Love Island Villa was 
humongous. So not only do we have a different villa, we have a different host, and it's at a different time of the year. So these are already placing mental blocks into a viewer's head. So already before the season begun, the viewers are thinking, the show that I love, it's completely changed, it's different, before we're even introduced to the first contestant. In a Guardian article written in January 2020, Stuart Heritage said, Winter Love Island is exactly the same as Summer Love Island. If you didn't like the original, there is nothing to suggest that you'll suddenly come around to it now. But if you're a fan, knock yourselves out. It goes on to mention the point of oversaturation of the show. Oversaturation has already killed everything from Big Brother to X Factor, and at this rate, Love Island might be- It now needs to source twice as many contestants a year without demonstrating a drop in quality. Surely there aren't enough identical preening burks in the UK to sustain that sort of output. I do agree with the point of oversaturation, I don't agree with the point where, oh, is there ever going to be enough people in the UK that can fill this position? Unlike X Factor, where you need to actually be a talented singer, that you need on Love Island is to show your face. You don't need some crazy obscure personality like Big Brother, but also with that point, there's no difference with these people. Our typecast every season. So there's an oversaturation in the sense of it's bloody boring! Despite the controversy, the season's still open to 4.8 million viewers, which was barely down from season 5 six months earlier. The season had a promising start, and despite the differing factors, it still felt like a normal season of Love Island, thanks to the typical typecasting. The cast as a whole lined up looked like any other previous season of Love Island. The show did receive 700 Ofcom complaints about contestant Ollie Williams, who I'm pretty sure was casted to fit the sort of Dr. Alex Curtis Pritchard, nice boy who could never find a girlfriend, and still people found pictures online of him hunting. And I think that was, I think that was, a, I think it was a wrap for him after that. He did leave off his own grounds, but whether that was a producer being like, or he was just genuinely missing his ex-girlfriend, which I think he said. This promising couple episodes where the cast looked like they usually did, did not hold up. The viewers dropped for the first time since Love Island started by 1 million viewers. 10 days after the previous Guardian article, which I referred to, where they were saying that, you love Love Island, you're gonna love this season. Another article was released by The Guardian, which was headlined, no more vacation, why we've fallen out of love with Love Island. And so within those 10 days, the general shift of the audience perspective was going from this is just like a normal season of Love Island, we love it, it's back! To, uh, yeah, this is why we've fallen out of Love Island, we don't care anymore. This season did not help itself in terms of it probably being the most boring season of Love Island today. Most people outside of someone who is like a super fan of this show could not not tell you a single thing about the season other than Shauna. I could not name you like one memorable fight or hilarious moment that people still reference to this day because there wasn't one. Many people were claiming that this is just a Poundland version of previous seasons. I mentioned the previous typecast of people. People, they were not living up to the previous people who were also typecasted for that role. It becomes a problem because it's all good and well typecasting on Love Island because you know that those type of characters work. But when you have direct almost copies of people in every season and then all of a sudden you get a bunch of them which are boring, which are directly comparable to previous people who are similar but far more entertaining, it's gonna look bad on this season. There was no Jack or Danny or Molly Mae and Tommy Fury love story to get behind. There was no friendships like Kem and Chris or Anna and Amber which you could root for. Just genuinely felt like watching 12 people coexist individually. And I do think that the reason for this being boring was partly due to the size of the show and how it had become. All the contestants who are now applying have over 200 episodes to go back and watch and see what someone did to do well or what someone did who didn't. It's very easy to go onto the show and be like, I'm gonna act like this, I'm not gonna do this at Casa or more, I'm gonna make sure that I stay with whoever I'm with from the start and that way the audience is gonna love me. In Brody de Chanel's YouTube video, Love Island, A Flirtation with Surveillance, she explained Foucault's panopticism. She explained it in an intellectual way, and I'm gonna dumb it down. It's basically the theory that the perfect prison would be a prison where the prisoners can be seen 24-7. Because in that way, if they constantly think that they're being watched, they're gonna start to self-regulate their behavior and make sure they don't misbehave because they never know when they're actually being watched. Love Island has multiple cameras, CCTV cameras, cameras on brookers, cameras behind mirrors, and the contestants are constantly mic'd up to the point where if they take it off, there'll be a voice of God being like, put your microphone back on. Old contestants have come off the show and explained that if they begin to talk about the outside world or a bombshell comes in and it's like you're being perceived well, the conversation is immediately shut down and they're told to speak about something relevant to inside the show. And to at least your partner, you will probably, as far as to my knowledge, not have an unrecorded conversation with you. Which means you go eight weeks not being able to technically fully be yourself with this person. Of course, if you are being recorded all the time and you have no idea what part of your conversation is going to be put on TV, if you have a quiet whisper conversation, if they're going to pick up
make it up and it play and it shows you to be a bad guy. You're going to start to self-regulate your behavior to make sure that you are acting in accordance to the way that you want to be perceived publicly 24-7. However, what that resulted in is people being far too mindful of their behavior to the point that they wouldn't want to get into confrontation or they wouldn't want to argue with their partner or they wouldn't want to tell that they're behaving in a bad way. The fear of the public not taking a liking to them and them not making it further and as a result, not getting the deals, not getting the fame, not getting the TV show appearances. The narrative does slightly change in future seasons, but even still, someone like Ekin Sue from season 8, she was so, like, here for the drama, she would argue with the girls, she would argue with the boys, she was still doing everything knowing the exact reaction she would get on the outside. She knew that people were starting to call the show boring, and she knew that people wanted drama, and she gave the public what they wanted, and they ate it up. She's a genius. Who go on and be like, I was truly myself. You're still subconsciously checking yourself. I know if I went on Love Island, there would probably be things that I would make sure I wouldn't say, because I wouldn't want that to go out on TV, because I wouldn't know how that would be perceived. But if I was having a conversation with my friends in the comfort of my own home, and I knew I wasn't being recorded, I would willingly probably have a very different type of conversation. One of the key things which we saw after season five of people being far more aware of was people playing the game or trying to win the money. I remember Molly May had a whole campaign online calling her Money May because she wanted the brand deals and was only there for that because she was an influencer prior to in the show. So for any Islanders post that, it was very important to come across as that you were there for love. All that you were there for was to find love you can possibly think of the millions of pounds that you can earn even though countless islanders before you have done that and in cases where people did bring that up such as jake cornish from season seven was accused of gameplay with partner liberty pool will instantly villainize and not only will the public but the islanders themselves will villainize you for trying to win a game show even though you are on a game show and people countlessly blame producers for the reason that the show has become boring but producers don't want boring television because boring television equals no one watching equals them being broke. They want it to be entertaining. The vast majority of reasons why Love Island is boring now is because people are far too aware of the public eye, which we saw for the very first time during season six. On the 15th of February 2020, previous host Caroline Flack sadly took her own life. Caroline would be the third related death to the show caused by suicide after season two contestant Sophie Graydon and season three contestant Mike Thalassitis also tragically lost their life to suicide. Many fans of the show called for the show to be axed because of this. Around the time a show on the same network, Jeremy Kyle, was cancelled, just one person related to the show tragically died of suicide. Two episodes were missed after Caroline's death, one being an unseen bit and one being a Sunday night regular episode. When the series returned on the Monday, the episode showed a tribute to Caroline and sponsors were pulled and adverts for the charity Samaritans were aired instead. After this episode, the series carried on as usual. Me, especially watching the show at the time, this felt like a very big underdressing of the situation. Especially when reports came out that contestants would not be made aware of Caroline's death. It just felt very uncomfortable to watch these people be on the show which she built up from the ground and it not really be addressed fully until the final and the contestants on the show having no idea. The show came under a lot of pressure to cease airing this season and cancelled the show as a whole. However, journalist Rachel Hughes claims that cancelling a show Flack publicly adored would be an insult to her memory. Flack always staunchly championed the show, priding the program on the positivity that lay at its heart. She helped people find love, and that was special. Speaking at the launch of the fifth series of Love Island in 2019, Flack explained, The show will always be positive. We've stood for positivity from day one. We're a show about love. There's nothing more positive in the world than love. That's what we create and are aiming for. We don't create any negativity. We've never been about the drama. We've never been about the fact. She added that she felt the show was blamed as a result of wider issues. We need to stop blaming and speculating without the fact. As a human race, we all need to come together, communicate, open up, express ourselves, be kind, and be understanding of what all of us are dealing with on a daily basis. Hughes raised the point that the real issue here was that we are all to blame for the current mental health crisis, and to pull Love Island would only be acting as a temporary plaster over a far deeper issue. And she finishes by saying Love Island execs can't be held responsible, and the show should not be used as a scapegoat. It's totally wrong to say the Love Island team do not do enough to protect welfare. Let's make some point which I agree with in the sense that the show is not fully to blame. Does it play a part? Yes. And she makes a really valid point that Caroline did love the show and was actually a very close friend of Laura. She also makes the point that if Love Island was to be cancelled, there probably would be another reality show that comes along which takes its place and would be just as toxic, which again, I probably do agree with. This may be easier to say in hindsight rather than being in the actual time frame. I 
don't agree with the decision to finish airing this season. I feel like a 48 hour break and a brief tribute was not enough time for people to process what was happening and grieve. And the fact that there was only one week left of the season, obviously I don't know the complications with contracts behind the scenes, but I don't think it would have been that crucial to the show if they had pulled that last week. Also in this final week of Love Island, the effects of COVID-19 were starting to reach the UK. During filming, two positive cases were confirmed in the UK. China had gone into lockdown. The UK had been advised against mass gathering and days after the final, it really really hit home in the UK with Italy going into lockdown. I just wanted to give you some context in terms of like the mood, the landscape, the atmosphere of the UK at the time of airing this season. It was a very dark time and everybody was very anxious and scared of not knowing what was happening and in general just quite sad. And watching these people whose main issue is if their man is going to make them an iced coffee in the morning was just an out of touch juxtaposition about what was a lot of people in the UK's current top issue. And this general atmosphere reflected in the viewing decline. A million or so viewers dropped off in the final week. Week, and the season finished with 3.6 million viewers at the final, being the lowest watched episode since season 3. The final did end with the closest final in Love Island history. Paige Turley and Finley Tap won the season with only 1% between them and runners up Shanice Fudge and Luke Trotman. The Islanders returned home as they usually do after the season and within weeks of returning back in the UK, the country began to shut down due to the pandemic. This resulted in the contestants not being able to do their usual rounds of PA, reality TV shows, events, which we had seen all the previous Islanders do in order to remain relevant. Companies were not wanting to advertise or spend as much due to the uncertainty of the world and how it could potentially affect the financial market so there was a lot less endorsement for Islanders. And people also just had far bigger issues on their plate as to whether did Finley and Paige move in together or has Shauna gotten her pretty little thing deal yet. The media outlets and just the general opinion of the public just focused on the pandemic and making sure friends and family are okay. The usual sort of interest in oh my god where is this Love Islander tonight? What are they doing? I need to check their social media was completely ceased just because Babe, we have bigger fish to fry. Because of that, it made this season very forgettable and the Islanders fade into irrelevancy quite quickly. And it was safe to say that the first installment of Winter Love Island, due to multiple factors, was not a success. <laughs> As the UK continued its lockdown and the pandemic was not looking like it was ending anytime soon, rumours about season 7's fate were in full sway. However, in May, the director of television at ITV announced that it would not be returning until 2021. break was probably well needed. Pre-COVID, the summer season was still in full effect to be starting in June, and I genuinely think if COVID did not happen, that season would have run the show into the ground. I don't think people were at all ready for another season. The pandemic also gave a lot of people some extra time on their hands, and with that extra time, there was a lot of people who were going back into reality TV archive. In particular, America's Next Top Model issues were being brought to light due to its extremely problematic past and issues of the show that people had found in their rewatch during quarantine. And with TikTok being a new social media platform that everyone was jumping onto during the pandemic, watching these clips and sharing them to TikTok, TikTok is so easy to make everything viral and many contestants from these reality TV shows were coming forward, including contestants from Love Island. Season 4 contestant Nar Aslam took to social media to speak his truth on his experience on the show. Back in Season 4, after just one week on the show, fan favourite Niall left the villa due to personal reasons. Once on the outside, he actually opened up about having Asperger's syndrome, explaining that that was the reason why he left. In 2020, he actually revealed that the real reason was because he entered a stress-induced psychosis. The producers knew of Niall's autism and was given barely any assistance on navigation in the villa. He said, I was ITV's performing monkey, made to do things I didn't want to do. It ended in me being desperately ill. He had one psychological test during his time in the villa, which he said felt a bit weird and strange considering producers were very aware of his Asperger's. I started to become very stressed and the producers got worried. I was known as the Rainbow Fish. On day nine, Nal found himself being led to the hideaway villa where he was met with a series counselor and executive producers. He got put in a car without any explanation. They kept asking me if I trusted them. My head was going a million miles per hour. He was not given any context of what was happening or that he was even leaving the show. A letter from the show's psychiatrist read, please send me anything you want me to look at if he does not settle in the next 24 hours. He is probably better out there or will risk him becoming full blown. Hopefully this can be done by the next boy exit. Tuesday, Nal was not the only past islander to come forward about the producer's behavior behind the scenes on the show. Season two contestant Sarah Holland has always been critical about the way that she was handled on the show. She said, two producers live in the basement throughout the show. They would say things like, right Zara, we want you to focus on so-and-so. You trust them. You think you're on a summer holiday and you might find love, but you're in a posh prison where you don't know what time it is and a voice in a wall tells you what to do. I honestly believe that was brainwashed. Speaking of the psych test prior to going into the show, we went into a little room and this woman asked, have you ever taken drugs? I said, no. Have you ever had a sexually transmitted disease? Again, I said no. Have you ever thought about killing yourself? No. I must have been in there for five minutes. She also claims that she is sure producers had some sort of hand in the way that the men were treating her and rejecting her in the villa. ITV disputes this claim. 
I'm putting this in here for context for a fair argument. On the night which I previously spoke about where she went to the hideaway with Alex Bowen, Zara said, I said to a producer, I'm not really sure I want to do this. He's not really my type. She said, don't worry, Zara. I'm going out with this guy who's not my type and it's amazing. Maybe that's where you're going wrong. That is in. Same. Again, ITV disputed this claim. They said the opinions Islanders have, decisions they make, and relationships formed are completely within the control of Islanders themselves. There was a few contestants who also came out about the body diversity on the show. In the previous season, Shauna came out and said that she felt like, in her own words, the token fat girl. Despite the fact that she lost four stone before the villa and was a size eight. Ellie Brown, who was on season four, she had also previously spoken out about the extreme dieting that many of the contestants do in order to go on the show. One of the biggest myths about Love Island is that we look so toned, tanned, and skinny all the time. She said, in reality, I practically starved myself going into the villa, eating nothing but fish and vegetables for months and spending hours sweating away in the gym each day. I can only applaud Islanders to come out and I can imagine it is a very terrifying position, especially with a corporation as big as ITV, to come out and speak your truth. Each of these people who have come out have given a really important context onto what actually goes on behind the scenes. After an 18 month hiatus, it was announced in May 2021 that Love Island would be returning officially for its seventh season. And then you guys, I do love the air. There was actually rumours that this season was encouraging LGBTQ plus contestants to enter after Love Island and Tinder did a sort of collaboration to increase applicants. They basically joined forces with Tinder in order to diversify their casting pool. And executive producer Richard Cowles said that the only necessities is that they are over at the age of 18 and have a Tinder account. However, <laughs> Commissioner Amanda Starby would come out and be like, not on my watch, gays. Not on my watch. She actually came forward in an interview with Radio Times and explained that LGBTQ plus contestants would be logistically difficult. In terms of gay islanders, I think the main challenge is regarding the format of Love Island. There's a sort of logistical difficulty because although islanders don't have to be 100% straight, the format must sort of give islanders an equal choice when coupling up. This isn't the first time the show has come under scrutiny when it comes to diversity. It's being criticized multiple times for the lack of diversity in terms of sexuality, body type, race, age, and even the type of people that they cast on the show. People have often joked on Twitter in the past being like, why have we never seen a goth on Love Island? And I know that people say this as a joke, but it is kind of true. Why hasn't there been a goth on Love Island? Contestants of the show are typically very much of the same nature. They often dress in very similar clothing, do their makeup in similar ways, have their hair in similar ways. Very rare that you would see a contestant on Love Island who dresses in more of an alternative style or is more experimental with their makeup. And there's a lack of diversity when it comes to things as shallow as the way someone chooses to present themselves. The things which are a lot more serious and pressing like things like the lack of body diversity on the show. The contestants are typically in good shape. The men usually have six pack and muscles. It actually conspired that from the starting lineup of this new season, there was only one contestant, Kaz Hamwi, who had allegedly not gone under body augmentation prior to the show, whether that was a boob job, lip filler, Botox, anything of that vein. And the lack of any previous diversity on the show, it shows that these people are already conforming to what is expected on the show before they even apply, whether it's a crash diet or starting a PT session because they know that's how they're more, more likely to get a place on the show. And in response to the claims that it is logistically difficult to include LGBTQ contestants, I'm sorry, that is just producers being lazy. It's a way of them being able to get out of actually having to diversify the show. I can't say it's logistically difficult when it has quite literally been done on their show before. There was actually a contestant on the season who was part of the LGBTQ plus community. I know that we were logistically difficult, but we still got our foot in the villa. Islander Sharon Gafka actually came out and revealed that she came out to their fellow Islanders as bisexual. However, the producers decided not to air this moment. <sighs> Now, like, I don't know if the producer said this or people just on Twitter said this. There wasn't any need to show this. Like, it wasn't part of a storyline. Like, it didn't add to anything. But I have to question, even if it wasn't from a genuine good place and it was more for the sake of saving their back and good PR, would it have killed them to just donate five minutes of an episode to this moment? Especially as it is a show which has come under a lot of scrutiny for purposely not including the LGBTQ plus community. Like, in terms of the lack of inclusion, and especially as sexuality is such a spectrum now, now, there is a multiple of group within the LGBTQ plus community who could logistically fit onto the show. You know, you could have pansexual islanders, bisexual islanders, who would still fit into the format of Love Island. But do I think that the action of not including specifically the LGBTQ plus community in Love Island is a reason for the downfall? No. If we're being brutally honest, I don't think the majority of the typical viewers of Love Island really care if there is any representation for that. However, as I've just shown you, it wouldn't be that hard to include it if you really wanted to. The show also came forward prior to the season starting to list its protocols in 
order to protect this year's Islanders. It included assessments by doctors, psychologists, and contestants' own general practitioners, social media training, financial advice, and adjusting to life back home, and eight therapy sessions after conclusion of the season. At the end of June 2021, Love Island returned to our screens. I don't know if it's just me, but this season's Islanders always stick out to me. Like, when I look at this cast as a whole, they feel a little different. Uh, they feel a little different, as if they're like putty or something. <laughs> I'm going delirious, this video is so long. But like, I don't know if that makes sense, but like, they just don't feel like Love Island contestants to me. But this series launched to 4.8 million viewers, which is a million up from the end of season six. So it was obvious that this break was well needed. This season was fine. It wasn't the worst, it wasn't the best. There was a handful of memorable moments. You know, I think of Chloe Burrows, Liberty Pool, Faye Winter, even the likes of Hugo Hammond. Like they're all still remembered in sort of the Love Island fan base today. The show did have some viral moments. They didn't feel as like, impactful or as conversational it's a big work some of that previous seasons Chloe Burrows going no way Rachel Finney's entrance in heels Lucinda constantly going really of course the moment that poor Liberty revealed that Jake said I love you and then he goes I do love you oh yeah fuck me. don't get me wrong there was some storylines to get invested in there was Millie and Liam's rocky relationship and the Curse of Lily. Chloe and Toby was another one that was an entertaining thing to watch. Faye and Teddy's tumultuous relationship. Liberty and Jake's slightly toxic. I don't really like to use the word toxic when it comes to relationships on the show because obviously we don't know the ins and outs. What was more great to watch was Liberty and Kaz's friendship, which side note, if we had to sit for a Curtis Pritchard and Tommy Fury spin-off, I at least think we deserve the Kaz and Liberty spin-off. And it seems that the male friendships are always highlighted here. What I will give this season its tens for was that Cassa and Maury coupling. It was the first time that they sort of let the Casa girls who weren't picked get their side of say, which allowed contestant Lily Hayne. For a bitch who didn't even make it into the villa, she really made her mark on this show. Even though there was a lack of drama and a lack of sort of certain something, it was a good solid season to get Love Island back on track. And don't get me wrong, there were some gag-worthy moments, like Shannon being dumped on day three by Tech, and Hugo saving Chloe from being dumped in a shocking recoupling speech. And it was the first season to feature the staple of movie night. This is an episode which purposes to purely close up. There is literally no other a reason for a movie night other to get these islanders riled up producers would put on a movie night where they would show islanders clips of things which have happened in the season thus far that other islanders may not know and it would be helpful to have context on the movie night was very similar to the sort of who said it challenge remember the challenge where they'd bring out clipboards and islanders would have to guess who said something bitchy by swirling them with a drink pretty much this but instead of guessing it's like bitch we will show you there is no guessing game. Guess who? Guess you. The fact that you are actually watching it being said or watching someone kiss someone who they shouldn't be kissing, the atmosphere feel a lot more tense than it in being in like a fun game where you whip off facilitate and throw a mocktail over someone's face. This first installment of movie night actually caused a lot of controversy. Ofcom received more than 25,000 complaints about Faye's treatments towards her partner Teddy. This was the most complaints of any TV show in 2021. Faye, who had previously admitted on the show to having trust issues, reacted pretty badly when she saw her partner Teddy having a flirty exchange with Cassa and more contestant Clarice. It was safe to say that our girl Faye did not mince her word. Despite the claims that Faye was out of order, Ofcom actually ruled Faye's behaviour as in, still in accordance to guidelines. The show finished with Millie Court and Liam Reardon being winners and the season had a series average of 4.17 million viewers which had its viewership up since season 6. I don't have much to say in context of the season without repeating myself on previous points. Obviously there was the usual people saying that the season was boring and we need to bring back the smoking area and drinking and what I have come to terms with about Love Island fans is that they will just complain for the sake of complaining. If they were to bring back smoking and drinking, they would find something new to complain about. And I think this is the case of a lot of reality TV shows. Not every episode is going to be entertaining. It is important for there to be cooler moments and for storylines to develop in a calmer situation. But if an episode is boring, immediately, immediately on Twitter you get the This show sucks! And does boring necessarily mean bad? Yeah, sure, it's not as entertaining, but is entertainment more important than the contestants' mental well-being? Obviously, there was no lockdown restrictions as well this season, so the Islanders were able to stay in the limelight. The E appeared as a contestant on Dancing on Ice. There was multiple huge brand collaborations, including Millie Core X ASOS. It really kind of felt like the Love Island bug may be catching on again. Series 8 returned the following year, again with the same host, Laura Whitmore. This was also the first season where they decided to cut the 
split or steal segment. Typically on previous seasons, the winners of the show would then be brought to the front and be like, oh, one of you is gonna have an envelope which says you can steal the money and if you get that, you have the choice. Obviously no one is going to pick that. The show is all about finding love. Especially in the current climate, as I mentioned, it is not appropriate to talk about playing a game. I think the show kind of wanted it to be a bit more like that at the start. The audience reaction didn't really take to that part of the show. They cared more about the love part. So you had way more to lose if you decided to steal the whole 25,000 in terms of brand deals and endorsements and spin-off shows with your partner on the outside because clearly people like you as a couple so you're going to be more marketable as a couple. So no one was ever going to steal. It didn't really matter that they got rid of this twist. The other preseason change that this was going to be the first season in recent seasons that there would not be a fast fashion sponsor and instead eBay was going to be the fashion sponsor. Previous seasons saw fast fashion juggernauts I saw at first and misguided be sponsors and you were able to shop the sort of dresses that the contestants were wearing live as the episodes were going on. But instead, celebrity stylist was going to scour eBay and hand pick items for Islanders to be able to wear while they're on the show. Which in premise sounds like a really cool idea. However, I think they kind of completely mishandled it. It proved to me that producers sort of got eBay on as a sponsor after the show has been criticized a lot for its morals and they were able to tick a box of look at us being ethical, look at us doing something moral without actually having to fundamentally change the bones or the structure or add any diversity to the show itself. But I still am holding out hope that they can do something fun with this sponsorship because it's fun. I think like if you give the Islanders a budget to be able to shop on eBay themselves before they come on. Series A actually launched to almost 5 million viewers with it being 4.98 million which is the most watched episode since season 5. The season to feature a deaf Islander with contestant Tasha Gori. Also the first series to bring back a Islander from a previous season with Adam Collard returning from season 4. This season really felt like it had some momentum behind it. Like it became that era of season 3, 4 and 5 where you could not escape Love Island. Thanks to Islanders like Ekansu, Davide, India, Dami, Luca and Tasha, there was multiple viral moments which had people talking and it really helped get the season's momentum going and people like remembering about Love Island. Like I said about the previous season, there was some viral moments but they were like jokey things like Chloe going no way. This season had viral moments which actually sparked conversation and wanted viewers to jump in so they could join in on the conversation which as I've mentioned is an essential component of Love Island. Ekansu crawling on the terrace, Davide's one-liners, Dami and India returning after Casa Amor, and Andrew revealing that he licked a tit. I licked her tit or whatever. The Casa Amor coupling was actually the first episode since season 5 to break 5 million viewers and the final ended on 5.5 3 million viewers. It really felt like after a rocky few years that Love Island could finally be on track and the hype was coming back. And post season these islanders saw some of the biggest deals in Love Island history. You had the usual sort of things which was expected from every season now. Ekin Sue became a contestant on Dancing on Ice, Davide received the Boohoo Man deal of the year, and Gemma Owen became the face of Pretty Little Thing. None of these things were new or exciting, but there were some really impressive things which had happened for the first time. India received deals to be the face of three separate brands, plus a regular hosting spot on the actual show itself a weekly appearance on Love Island after some and Ekansu received the highest deal in Love Island history with one million pounds for her Opoly collection. I'm pretty sure Opoly are actually asking for it back now because she didn't make it back but still no so done, Mama. Well done, Mama. And while it was a good season, for a lot of people, there was a period where it was looking like a lot of people were going to tune out. There was a lot of misogyny and toxic masculinity within this season. Many of the men spoke derogatory towards the women in the villa. Luca, Dami, Davide and Jack all came across at some point pretty badly with the way that they spoke to the women on the show. During Catherine Moore, Jax decided to also explore his options with new girls Cheyenne and Molly. Jax was quoted to say that he preferred Cheyenne because she was quieter. He, however, didn't couple up. Cheyenne Diane did reveal a lot of what happened at the Castle Mori recoupling. The Lily effect. I'm telling you, that girl had a blueprint on the show and she didn't even enter the villa. However, Paige still decided to get back with Jax. They seemed to be like they were going pretty good. Adam Collard returned to the show and Jax didn't like the fact that Paige was wanting to get to know him. Despite the fact he was literally kissing multiple girls a week prior. Jax gets clearly upset over this and he sort of takes it out on Paige. Pretty obvious he was struggling to handle his emotions in that villa. And in the end, he decided to voluntarily leave the villa. This wasn't the first time that we had seen a contestant go through something quite emotional and decide to leave the villa. Brought in a new duty of care prior to season 5. During that season, we saw contestant Amy Hart go through her first love and her first heartbreak. Prior to Catherine Moore, she was partnered up with Curtis. Amy walked in thrilled to see that Curtis had not coupled up, only to find out that he actually did want to partner up with someone else, but the girls didn't want him. 
Otis decided to break up with Amy and proceed to explore a relationship with fellow Islander Maura Higgins, which was pretty upsetting for Amy to watch. She seemed very heartbroken in a lot of scenes of her final episodes, and it was quite emotional and upsetting to watch. And then it almost seemed that overnight she had sort of come to some sort of clarity, conclusion, and resolution that she couldn't be in the villa to be able to get over Curtis. And if she wanted to move on with her life and actually heal from the situation, she had to remove herself from the villa, which she did. She voluntarily left the villa. Very, very quick change for someone to sort of go from being so emotional emotionally upset over a situation to then being able to come at it from a reasonable standpoint. It turns out that Amy had actually received help 12 times while she was in the villa and the on-site therapist of the show helped her to realize that to be able to get over the situation she needed to be in a different environment and voluntarily left. I don't have any evidence or proof that this is what happened with Jax. He's not come out and said that. There's been nothing that's confirmed this. Just from my personal point of view you can see a lot of similar situations between Jax and Amy. That they were both in a very emotionally charged situation and quite quickly they managed to come to terms with it and realize that the best way to sort of process everything was to be not in this environment. And in my opinion, this is a necessary step that producers needed to take. Not only does it sort of stop a situation from escalating too far to the point where either the islanders themselves get into too dark of a place or also the people from outside on Twitter and on social media. We also need to speak about Luca from this season. The main source of the sort of misogynistic bullying of the season came with the treatment of Tasha. For a while, many people in the villa had a question mark over Tasha's intentions in the villa. A few days after Casa Amor, Tasha decided to close things off and she asked Andrew to be her boyfriend. That night, there was also a public vote which Tasha and Andrew landed in the bottom for and that upset Tasha. But the boys don't agree with this and they again question Tasha's intentions because why should you be upset about being in the bottom when you've just become official? This should be a happy night. They take it way too far. Luca takes it upon himself to go over to Tasha while she is crying to say she shouldn't feel like this. And this sort of coldness and harshness towards Tasha continued for a, quite a few episodes. It continued on movie night. Tasha gets upset after a challenge and Luca says she can't be upset over it, it's just a game. Having it also wasn't the nicest, but I think he got away with a lot of what he said because it was disguised in humor and people found him and Ekansu funny together, but they were calling out Luca and Dami and Jax. It's only right to also call out Davide. The whole thing felt very uncomfortable to watch. And it came to a point in the season where a lot of people were like, this is uncomfortable and if it doesn't stop, I don't know how much more I want to watch it. Luca did eventually apologize to Tasha, but it Again, like the Jack situation, it looked like a producer or a therapist had sort of stepped in behind the scenes and rationalized the situation. It shows that if the contestants are not able to self-regulate themselves and keep to their behavior that is acceptable for public viewing, then producers will have to eventually step in. During the success of the season, ITV actually revealed that it would be back for the second ever installment of Winter Love Island in January 2023. But as the great philosopher Cheryl Cole once said, too much of anything can make you sick. Do you think I'll phone 11 hours from England to piss you off? After the end of season 8, it was announced that Laura Whitmore would be stepping down from her position of the host of Love Island. I personally did not think Laura was a bad host at all. I think she did a really fine job, especially with the context of how big the shoes were to fill. Still convinced that people just stuck onto this whole we need Laura Whitmore out of their thing because they wanted a thing to be angry about. Human nature, like there needs to be something for us to complain about, especially British people. In October, it was announced that Maya Jammer would be stepping in as the new host of Love Island. I think Maya is a really good fit for the show. She's a big figure in Gen Z and Millennials. That fun, sexy, like, feel that the show needs from a host. Egg and Sue did say that she was approached for the show but decided to turn it down. However, ITV execs actually came out and was like, we always had Maya Jammer as our top pick. We always wanted Maya Jammer. And I definitely believe that ITV execs over Ekin here. By no doubt, I'm sure maybe there was a question of Ekin going on. But after the hate the show was receiving for putting Laura as the host, there was no doubt on my mind that they were going to go for a fan favorite choice of Maya Jama, who fans have been calling for to host the show for three years now. The ninth season would not only be the first season that Maya Jama hosted, but it would be the first season where contestants would have a social media ban. This would mean that when they go on their account, it is completely locked off. They simply change their bio to, I'm going to find love on Love Island. And I have thoughts on this and I'll get into them later on in this video because they're not here in the script And I think that I must be speaking about it more on. <laughs> but going into the season should do really well Not only was it coming off a huge high of the previous season and a lot of the islanders have been very successful It also had a new host which fans have been begging the show to put on for ages So it should have done well, right? It, it didn't. Well, it did fine, but not great The show launched to 3.3 million viewers which was down over one and a half million from the previous season The way television ratings were recorded all 
also changed between the two seasons, so now you can only see official ratings of the show if the show is in the top 50 shows of the week. Only 6 out of 49 episodes actually made that top 50, and on average, number 50 in the top 50 would be coming in at around 2.7 million viewers. So that would mean consistently the show was getting less than 2.7 million viewers, which was down at least 2 million from the past 6 months. The season did start off quite strong, and there was great dynamics between the guys and the girls. One of my favourite islanders, maybe ever, Zara, came in as an early bombshell, and she really provided one of the best weeks in the show's history. Tanya, Liv, Shaq, Tom, Tanya, Ellie, Ron, and Lana all added loads to the dynamic of those first few weeks, which really felt good. However, Zara was dumped just two weeks into her stay with Tanya shortly following her. Own. I would say that they were the two main sources of drama. And after the departure of Zara and Tanya, the series fell flat pretty quickly. A lot of the conversations just sort of became talking behind people's back, and it just felt like a very negative vibe around the villa, and no one was really that happy. The second half of the season, boy oh boy, that went down even worse. And after this point, not a single episode actually made it into the top 50. Tanya became the public's number one enemy after she brought someone back from Casa Amor and her partner Shaq didn't. Which multiple men have done before and no one gave a shit. But as soon as a woman does it, Oh, eh. Men have literally done it before and gone on to win the show. Tanya could not escape like hate on social media until literally the end of the season. And guess what? Her and Shaq are still together. How many other couples from that season are still together? Oh, very tiresome to watch, like people speaking behind their backs and then when they got called out, oh my god babe, no I didn't say that. I just think there was too much viewer fatigue to be able to watch 16 weeks of Love Island nightly a year. I think if Winter Love Island was introduced earlier, around about maybe after season 4 when the hype and excitement of it was there and it was a new exciting show, it could have maybe worked as a prospect and people would have gotten used to that while they were still excited about the show, but to introduce it now when a show is this far in. Where it's not really one of those reality shows like, like Survivor or something where each season has a specific theme and each season has a slightly different feel to it. Every season follows the same format with the same types of islanders. This was also the first season which introduced a social media ban. Contestants of the show were no longer allowed to have a loved one or a management if they signed to it for the pre-season. Take over their social media and you know, they would sort of post maybe pictures that they took pre-show. The show would provide them with pictures from inside the villa, from their phones they could post. Family members would take to like their stories to do Q and A so you could get an intel on the islanders on the show. However, due to internet trolls, producers decided to ban social media while they were in the villa to try and put a stop to that. And while the logic does make sense, and those family members or loved ones or friends, whoever has taken over the account, don't have to deal with hate. It's still gonna be there, and instead now the person is just gonna come off the show and get a bombardment of it. I remember Tanya from the season said in an interview that when her and Lana got given her phone back, she genuinely couldn't look at it. So I can only imagine how much more it is intent to go through if you don't have a family member going through your accounts while you're on there and deleting the worst of it. The social media ban did have an effect on the show, in my opinion. Although it's put in place for the better well-being of the contestants, and if this is done properly and there is still someone to filter through stuff, I agree with that decision. But season 9 became the least followed season ever, and it became the first season since season 1 where not a single contestant reached a million followers. Now this isn't just due to the social media ban. In general, there is very much a death of the stereotypical influencer with the rise of TikTok and the normal person influencer. This is the ninth season. We're in the 300s now of Islanders. If you can't offer something different, then I already follow like my 10, 15 favorites who I already know I like their posts, I don't need to be adding new people into the cycle. To my knowledge, not a single contestant from this season ended up doing reality TV work after. I know it's only been six months at the time of filming since the season ended. There's been a whole other new set of Islanders. So I feel like any reality TV show now is just gonna pick one from this button. Also to my knowledge, the only sort of big brand deal that came out of this season, the only deal that I was aware of was Tom X eBay. I don't get it either. Anyway, the season ended, the final four weeks, not a single episode, including the final, made it into the top 50, so we don't even know what the season finished on. And the fact that Love Island was coming back again in under three months time, Oh, brother! These are 10 like summer seasons usually do kicked off in June 2023 and this would actually be the first year in Love Island history that two seasons would air at the same time. It was planned once before as I mentioned in 2020 but Covid stopped that happening. So this was the first time we were actually going to see how two seasons in one year would play out. I don't care what anyone says, two and a half months is not enough time between full eight week Love Island season. Get over everything that's happened, get bored again and get excited for a new season. I need that full calendar year for that to happen. The fatigue felt really 
really real and producers definitely knew this because there was little to no promotion for season 10. Challenges were only released a week prior to the season starting and a lot of people didn't realize that the show was on until the day it was actually airing. They were like, wait, this shit has started again? And hell, give me a break! The lack of promotion for the show was definitely due to producers knowing that people were not quite ready for another season, so they didn't want to overkill the promotion and make people sick of it before it even started. However, the season kicked off, and in the overnight officials, it was down 100,000 viewers from the previous season. Just like the previous season, this started off looking like it was going to be a pretty solid season. There was a lot of great reaction from social media towards the season. People were saying it was the best season since season 5. People are saying the producers are producering. And it really helped that some good early storylines were cemented early on. You had the Molly, Zach, Catherine, Mitch, Love? Square? Well, Mitch and Catherine weren't involved, so two triangles, whatever that makes. You had Ella and Tyreek's early stage of their relationship where they were bickering, it didn't really change much from the early stage, but anyway. And season two Islander Katie made a return to this season. Everybody already on social media was saying that the season felt like old school Love Island, so the fact that the producers picked pretty much the poster girl of what old school Love Island was all about, I have to I have to applaud. And the addition of Katie led to what might possibly be the best five minutes in Love Island history. I mean, now you look at it in hindsight, it kind of takes away a lot of the effect when you know what happens after. But at the time of watching this, I was goop. And guys, BAFTA worthy. In the villa, new bombshell Katie got her first pick of who she wanted to couple up with. Katie decided to choose Molly's partner, Zach. But what her and her fellow islanders didn't realize was that meant that Molly was now dumb. Dun, dun, dun. This was genuinely so good and this went viral on Twitter. Reactions were crazy and it really felt like that season 3, 4, 5 energy where things were going viral on Twitter and people in day to day life were back talking about Love Island. I had so many of my friends like ask me in real life like wait I've seen this Molly thing on Twitter like do I need to start actually watching this season because everyone's saying it's so good. The season continued to go from strength to strength. The addition of Scott was great. It truly felt like this season was building up to get Love Island back on track after a really rough winter season. After so many seasons seasons where the formula was the exact same and producers were too scared to make a decision which was going to be too controversial or upset the public too much. Seeing a key character like Molly just go home instantly like that kept everyone on their toes and made the show feel exciting again like you could predict what the next four weeks were going to be like we have for the past five years. This was all until Castle Moore came on. And who was in the lineup for Castle Moore? None other than Dumped Islander Molly. Twitter did not react well, there was even a rumor that Molly's mum was an ITV producer and this was the plan all along to get her back in and get people back on her side. Turns out she was an extra on Coronation Street, so I don't know who the f*** made that up. But people were rightfully calling this out, saying that it was unfair that she was able to go back outside, see her friends and family, see how the audience reacted to her on social media, change her behavior, and come back into the villa for a second chance. In my opinion, it ruined any momentum this season had. That whole, oh my god, what's gonna happen next? This feels like the early seasons of Love Island was completely shattered. As a re-inclusion of Molly just reminds you how heavily producer manipulated the show has become. And honestly, there was no actual need for Molly to return. I actually quite enjoyed Molly and yeah, I went for a few weeks where I was like, she doesn't need to be here, but she seemed like a sweet girl. And she really provided in those early weeks. She was pretty much the focal point. But after her and Zachariah sort of like settled down, she faded into the background, which is what she did when she came back anyway. I think the producers lost more bringing her back than they gained because we had already seen Molly wasn't really a confrontational girl so she was hardly gonna make a scene when she came back. As a whole, Katara Moore sort of flopped in general this year and I think it's time to cut that twist. Just like how I mentioned when people can watch previous seasons and learn what did well and how someone behaved to win. Katara Moore has had so many renditions now that we saw this season the very stereotypical ways which people behave or have behaved in the past and have gone on to become public favorite implemented very poorly. Whether it's someone like Tyreek who if on the real world he probably would have gone for someone but he knew he was on a television show and he wanted to make himself look good so much so that he was egging others on to get with people. People. And even just the cast and more people come across so desperate because this is their only one chance to get in the villa. It's not a good twist. The cast and more it sort of fell down a similar fate of the previous season where it just sort of got a bit dark and bitchy. The treatment of Abby was extremely uncomfortable to watch. Tyreek, Mitch, and Sammy continued to speak down to the women on the show. And this as a whole is something that is putting me as a viewer off Love Island. The fact 
that the misogyny on the show continues to happen season after season and nothing seems to be done about it. After season 8, this is the second season within one year where there has been multiple occasions where multiple men have spoken in a derogatory manner towards the woman in the villa without seemingly any consequences. Yeah, I'm sure they may apologise. Tyreek apologised for telling Whitney to shut up. Luca apologised for being harsh to Tasha. Even though people like Tyreek and Luca apologise for every time they mess up, Tyreek was still telling women to shut up literally the episode before the final. Especially when this show is so popular with young girls and boys. Having people like Tyreek who constantly on a weekly basis are telling women to shut up and putting them in their places and saying, I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking to your man, you can't speak to me. It's setting a precedent to them that this behavior is okay because no one is calling him out on it and he is not changing his way. Tyreek is not just the only person, by the way. I'm just using him as, as an example because this video has been so long. But there has been countless men in recent seasons who have behaved like this as well. It is not just Tyreek. Whilst the series had a positive start, the fatigue crept in pretty quickly. I personally stopped watching the show nightly, like in the final two weeks. And this was the first time in Love Island history I have stopped religiously watching every episode before the end. I had a look on Twitter after the final and the tweets, while they had interaction, there was not the interaction of previous seasons which upwards of 50,000 likes on tweets. I don't need to ask Molly Mayer's permission. Where do I think the downfall of Love Island went wrong? Obviously the main issue just lies in there being a fatigue of the show. And this isn't necessarily the show's fault itself. Any sort of TV show, whether it's reality TV or scripted, is gonna come to a natural decline at some point and to to even hit 10 seasons is an impressive feat for any TV show. I'll say though that Winter Love Island is definitely not needed. I understand from an economic perspective that it's a lucrative addition for ITV2 because even if viewers are dwindling, it's still gonna be the most watched show on ITV2 that year. However, for the longevity of the show and for keeping your fan base like on your side, I just don't think it's necessary. There was supposed to be a third season of Winter Love Island this year, but I believe it's just been announced that it's been scrapped and an All Stars is coming instead. I really don't think we need an All Stars season either. Let's just leave Islanders done. A lot of people said that the social media Media ban was to blame. In two minds about this because as I made a point earlier in the video, these islanders coming off the show and remaining relevant and doing all these other deals and TV shows post Love Island is actually a really important factor to the show and the show's growth. The show relevant, it introduces new people to the show. It doesn't make you sort of forget about it. Look at these winter Love Islanders of the ones that have just passed and I can't remember any of them. And because none of them are on my social media page or I'm being reminded about none of them, I forget about the season and then I'm just like, wait, this show's kind of flop now. Like I don't even remember any. Obviously the more followers the show can get the Islanders, the more relevant it's going to remain and the best way to do that is to have their page active during the show because that is when your parasocial relationship will be at its highest. Two weeks after the show's ended when they're back in the UK and on their phone they're showing you their life. I've already moved on babe. I've already started a new Netflix show that I'm binging and I'm focusing on these people instead. I do think it plays somewhat of a part of the show feeling like it's dying. A lot of people criticize the show for having the same format still and not changing it up but this part is far more of a sticky part because if they keep the show the same then people are going to say it's boring and people are going to say they don't care anymore because they feel like they've watched the same season over and over again. But if they were to switch up the format, you're going to have the exact same people being like, why are you messing with the format? I hate how new this show feels now. But I do think the solution to this is keeping the bones and structure of the format the same and making tweet with the core. Like for example, I think movie night was a great addition and really helped shake up and give the show a lease of new life. I think it is time to ex Casra more. There's also a lot of dating shows out there right now. Netflix obviously has Too Hot to Handle, The Old Mayhem and Love is Blind, which are three extremely popular dating shows. And they all come in with a different sort of point of view than Love Island. They all offer something a little bit different. It's not just, here are a bunch of 12 very good looking people which we're just gonna dump on an island and see what they're gonna do. It has a bit more of a meaningful message, most of them, or an interesting dynamic, especially the old Mayhem, whoever came up with that show. Also, these shows are far more diverse than Love Island. In terms of age, body diversity, race, even sexuality, The Ultimatum just did a specific queer version of The Ultimatum. But these shows have less of a commitment. They aren't nightly. There's a set amount of episodes which have all been pre-recorded. So while they're really fun and entertaining to watch, I do slightly feel like it's not the same as Love Island. You don't get the same effect that you get on these contestants as you would on a Love Island. So I don't think these shows are direct threat as such right now. Do I think the more of them that pop up and the more popular and the more that these dating shows show, we can do a successful show and make it diverse and fun and include everyone. It can harm Love Island, yes, but I don't think it's at that stage right now. Where does this leave Love Island? I'm 
mean it's not dead. It is still a huge moneymaker and the most popular British reality TV show for the past seven years. I know I mentioned that season nine only managed to get six episodes in the top 50 of the week, which sounds bad in retrospect to how popular previous seasons were, but for ITV2 to even have one episode in a top 50 most viewed as a week is a win for ITV2. This isn't a main channel. So these viewing figures are still great for ITV2. Do I think the buzz has died? Yes. Do I think that there is a way to gain it back? I don't think so, but I don't necessarily think it needs to be gained back. Every show, whether reality or scripted, comes to a natural decline, comes to a natural peak and end. When it starts to become an issue, when TV producers start to scramble and panic and they're like, wait, how do we get back to that peak? And they start throwing things at a wall and twisting and changing everything and the show becomes a shell of the version it once was and loved. I think the best thing producers can do right now is just keep going as they are, not changing up the format too much and keeping the fan base that they already have happy. Because as soon as you start trying to change and pander to gain new audience members, that's when you start turning off the people who have been there for a while and then you're really left with nothing. I saw that happen with Big Brother UK and it was a mess and no one remembers the end of Big Brother fondly. I think Love Island has probably another five seasons in it and then it can bow out gracefully and I don't think that that is an issue. I don't think Love Island needs to go on forever and ever. I don't think that Love Island needs to continuously be on a rise and find new fans along every step of the way. TV shows need to come to an end at some point and that is okay. Thank you very much for watching this video oh my god i think i have recorded for three and a half hours obviously i want to condense this down but i don't know if you can tell my voice has gone whole if you guys enjoyed this video please let me know i have spent so much time and effort the lumen script i've written is 12,500 words and it's just a note form i've already started working on a similar video like this for the x factor so if you guys want to see that let me know if you have made it this far i'll see you guys soon for a brand new video bye